What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History at Henry Zamoda. Danny of Delgibar, what's up, man? How are you? Chilling, man. As per usual, how about yourself? I'm doing pretty well. We have some exciting news today. I got a uh, email about I don't know three hours ago. Some some at some point today, I got an email congratulating me on uh, being the number one podcast in Azerbaijan. Wow. Believe it or not. Number one podcast in Azerbaijan. That's the news category too, right? The new in news, number one news podcast in Azerbaijan. That's, and I think we're number wow. three in Turkmenistan, right? Or, yeah, something like that. Something like that. So Wow. Um, wow, wow. Number wow. you're listening to the number one podcast in Azerbaijan. Number what one a Azeri podcast. It's been two it's been two years and never <laughs> knew when we were going to get to the point where, uh, you know, we could focus, we can we can move into bro history full time and make this a media <laughs> empire, and now we finally got the we're recognition. There. We're there. Um, and the uh, I guess the feedback from the public that we were looking for. Yeah. Number one, Azerbaijan. Yeah. Um, how many downloads was that? Well, uh, thirteen. 13,000 downloads in Azerbaijan. <laughs> Can you believe it? I just want to thank Thir- all of our fans in Azerbaijan. Thir- because we couldn't have gotten that, here without you. Is that 13,000 or no, 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 130,000? No, no, no. 13, 1, 3. Double one, digits, baby. Double one, digit one, numbers. Double digit download one, numbers. Yeah. Oh, all time. 13, da- 13 downloads. 13 downloads. Yep. I can't believe it. Uh, what, what do you think? What, 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 I actually haven't looked at this, and we can do this live. But like, what? Which ones? Which episodes do you think the Azeris liked? I don't know. Um, so, with those sliding scales from Apple, um, the way it works is that they they take podcast they they rank podcast based off like a weighted score. So um, you're not necessarily the most downloaded podcast, but if you're like getting a a, a spike then they'll put you on a list because at one point in in the u.s we were like number 30 in news and politics mm-hmm. which was um, actually really awesome which, which was awesome but now we're not in that ranking anymore because we're um there's newer podcasts that they put on that list and um so I guess we're just getting that uh there, there's a spike in, in 13 people listening to bro history in azerbaijan so uh, it's it's just doesn't know what to do with the algorithm like oh this new thing but, um, Hottest new yeah. podcast in Azerbaijan Hot, broad hottest. history. Yeah. Well, um, you want to get started into what we're talking about today? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so today we're talking about the Civil War. Um, we were trying to, I guess we're, we're trying to do an episode right now, and maybe this can go in a couple of different directions, but we wanted to concentrate on uh, two aspects and uh, one of those aspects being the global impact of the of the American Civil War, along with um, what were some of the major innovations that changed the world out of the Civil War. And um, from there, um, I guess really just see where this episode takes us. Um, just duly noted, you know, neither of us are Civil War historians. However, these shows, as always, are meant to generate interest in the topics. They're not meant to be, uh, you know, um, authoritative uh, shows on these subjects. But I think you really can consider the American Civil War as the or one of the first modern wars, For if sure. not the first modern war. For sure. Um, it was the first war to take maximum advantage of the production of the Industrial Revolution. Mm hmm. And these increases in productivity made it possible to free large numbers of men for military service. The factory system and and mass production, along with with, uh, technological innovations and and things like chemistry, um, led to really just an explosion in military technology. And it may have been the first war to pull the entire population of each combatant. So it was all out war. Like everyone was um, impacting the war effort. 
And these large conscript armies require the industrial and, and, and agriculture base to, to not only feed them, but to clothe them, to uh, subl- supply them for combat. Therefore, the civilian population working in the factories, you know, the people working on the farms, the people supplying soldiers on the field, they there's a merger between the civilian population and the war machine. Right. In Europe, it's different at this time. Like, you know, it's a professional army in Europe, and um, there's not, like, this huge... Uh, just, just war. war. I mean, there Literally. there yeah. has been there there is like in the in the Napoleonic era, era, but at this time there really isn't anything like this. And because of this merger uh, with the civilian population and the war machine, um, the, the the production base and in the in the civilian industrial manpower um, become legitimate military targets. Right. And you see that with the Union Army really just burning everything down in its path as a march to Georgia. Right. So it's like a very different war at this time. Like, you know, there's, there's gentlemen war, gentlemen's wars in Europe gentlemen's uh, warfare, where people like where agree lineup. on a time and there's yeah. like rules of war mm-hmm. and, um, you know, don't fight at night, no raids. Um, you know, we'll, we'll agree to do it on this date on this battlefield and people would come and watch. Um, and people did do that in the beginning of the war, but um, they expected the Union to um, really just annihilate the Confederacy quickly. And then they ended up being it's like, we need to get the fuck out of here. This, this is not going to happen. But I'm interested in, in, in talking about what was the what was Europe's perspective on, on the war. And I find this really difficult to really understand your the, the European perspective on the Civil War. Because I've read different things like, you know, I've read things that say that um, a lot of tactics were uh, inspired by the Civil War. It was, it was studied in great detail by different military commanders and, and other people and other and I've heard other sorts of say that wasn't the case at all, that Europe didn't really um, they they either did not really care too much about it or they just thought it was so kind of alien and exotic that it wasn't even uh applicable to what they were doing at the at that time like the the u.s the united states was a really big frontier there were really large spaces and in europe you know you have more more condensed battlefield uh more so like one large army and wars were decided by a couple decisive uh decisive wins it wasn't like this system in, in america where there's like these more so uh, a lot of medium sized armies fighting over the huge frontiers and, and huge open spaces. And at this time, there's a lot of war going on in Europe as well. So between 1880, 1853 and 1871, there was the Crimean War. There was the Italian War. There's the Danish War. There's the Austro-Prussian War. There's a lot of violence going on. And there was already... Um, Europe, European military leaders, they already had plenty of food for thought for, as far as tactics. Right. Um, what really limited the relevance of, of the Civil War uh, military experience was the recognition that the American political system and theater of operation was just vastly different from what they were doing in, all over in Europe. And both the Union and Confederacy, they maintained a number of you know, these medium-sized armies and they were strong like, they, they were covering like really just large spans of territory and by by european standards um the force to space ratio in america was very very low um in contrast in europe operations during this period were were, were were conducted in, in, in just these small spaces by large armies. And Europeans had unique concerns that were produced by their own experiences. And, and the American experience uh, really appeared not to provide them the answers to these questions, or at least not all of the answers to some of the questions they had regarding battlefield tactics. Nevertheless, uh, most 
European countries, they sent obser observers to America to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they did pick some stuff up. This is where my confusion really sets in on the topic. Um, you hear things like Prussian commanders were, you know, they went there and they were very unimpressed with the uh, kind of how green a lot of the officers were uh, in both the Union and the Confederacy. And that was the case, mm -hmm. especially on the Union side. You're dealing with a very green army um, on the Union side. Um, so I'm sure they were just thinking this is a full off shit show. Like what we get, what can we really use from this? What can we take from this? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure they did learn like the one lesson was that military might required sufficient in, a sufficient industrial base and a, and a supply of manpower and um they had to have taken into account the the uh the need to have large reserve forces that could that could mobilize on short notice along railways because the railway officer who could plan and, and implement deployment schedules really became the most valuable officer and professionalized general staffs in europe mm -hmm. So that's what I would imagine would be the main takeaways of what they're they're looking at. But all in all, it's still an answer I'm trying to search for. Like, what was the overall view? I'm sure it was a very mixed bag. And I think it really uh, just came down to interests, you know. Uh, and a lot of different European countries had different interests, specifically within, um, uh, you know, northern or southern, like, alliances. Like, uh, I know... in. in Pretty soon we're going to talk a little bit about cotton and stuff like that. But a lot of, you know, um, a lot of European countries depended on textiles, you know, cotton for textiles. You know, so they had a stake in the game and they might have had an opinion in one way. But at the same way, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking Britain in, uh, specifically, they didn't want the U.S. to invade Canada. Well, they didn't want the Union to invade Canada. So while they needed the textiles from the south, they didn't want their, you know, uh, colony in the north and their um, uh, area of free trade, uh, you know, to get basically ransacked by the Union Army. So they, they were kind of at a, like a weird standstill, right? Um, I, I, I think they, they, the British probably looked at the Civil War or, you know, the United States in general and, and engaging in, in, um, in warfare there again uh, as probably not, <laughs> not a great idea. They probably thought of it as, as like a quagmire, almost like our Middle East conflicts today. Well, Britain, at that time, they were trying to pull out of America. Right. America really was kind of like their Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They had already been kicked out of their colonies. Um, they were losing influence in their Canadian provinces. They were like, all right, let's focus on the Near East and the Far East and, and colonize these places with fertile, mm -hmm. fertile grounds and right. natural resources. They were over and done with America at that point. The last thing that they wanted was to recognize the confederate the formerly recognize the confederacy as a formal state and then have the uh the union go ahead and declare war and invade canada exactly mm -hmm. however um britain was out of all the european countries that were sending people to watch these battles go on um britain was definitely watching the closest they had the, the biggest invested interest they had the highest chance of being drawn into the war for one reason or another or another and they had strong economic ties with with the Confederacy and the British textile industry completely. De it depended on southern cotton. Right. Um, cotton co comprised of 59 percent of the exports out of the United States before the war. I think about 80 percent of the uh, the imported cotton from the uh, from the British textile industry was from was from the Confederacy. When the Union blockaded major southern ports, stalling the cotton economy, um, the British had had to find other options because prior to them buying their or, or, or importing their cotton from the Confederacy, they were getting their textiles from India, but that was actually um, interrupted by the by Napoleon so they had a fine they were they were importing it from India in like the early 1800s 
and that was interrupted by the Napoleonic Wars. Right. So I mean, the war in 1812 was, you know, created a huge need for agricultural exports to Europe while they rebuilt after that war, you know, like they were still writhing in pain from that. Like a lot of their, their, um, you know, crop lands and stuff like that were the battlefields. You were pointing out earlier, you know, kind of the differences in the, in the scale of the warfare uh, of the United States versus Europe, where, you know, in Europe, you know, some some Europe, some large European countries are smaller than you know medium-sized states in the United States. You know, and when they would fight these battles, they'd fight these large-scale battles on relatively small areas, uh, which would really wreck the land. You know, um, so as a result, there were a lot of European nations were were relying on the United States for for agricultural exports. Cotton being one of the bigger ones, but also just wheat. You know, corn, shit like that. You know. Yeah, but it, cotton was was definitely number one. They were depending on like corn. There was native. There's also native um, things in in North America, uh, like something like corn. However, cotton was a big thing because the British textile, the, the cotton gin was was booming. Um, British textile was booming, and there was a really large demand of it. So they just just to, to kind of pull back. Um, so there. Are, they had a resort to uh, getting their cotton from from Asia after Napoleonic Wars. Um, well, they, well, they couldn't import it from there anymore, and they had to you know create that relationship with their former colony again. The Union blockade on Confederate ports it didn't entirely prevent the cotton from leave, leaving the South. Like mm. the, when the Union blockaded the South, it was just their key port cities like. Um, there, there are major cities on the coastline, but that's we're talking about miles and miles of coastline. There's no right. way that you can uh, enforce a blockade. They on, can try. <laughs> they, they can try, but it's yeah. not gonna. It's not really going to be feasible. The only thing you can do is just um, um, try to prevent the cotton factors, like the people that would. Um, the, the way that it was set up in the South was that they had like these informal relations. These, these informal. Uh, kind of business relations between cotton producers along with um, with factors cotton factors and the producers would sell the cotton to the factors and the factors would would iron out the deals with uh, with the international business and they were very kind of informal type business relationships like no contracts or anything like right. that it's Shaking just you dump your shit right. mm-hmm. you dump your shit off and they give you money mm-hmm. so just preventing them from from uh, exporting would probably what was their their main goal. However, cotton was still getting out, but the price still uh, was driven up exponentially. Right, because so, there was an added risk, like all that added. Even if it couldn't completely stop the cotton from going out, you know, just the risk that you know a vessel could be, you know, either taken, you know, uh, uh, hostage or or even scuttled, you know. And then there goes all your product. Like that risk alone increased it, increased the prices, and then just the decrease in in um, in the supply also increased the the demand and therefore the price. And the the shortfalls in in shipments from America, um, what it did is that it stimulated cotton production in places like India, or Egypt, or in Brazil, and. Um, all, all these countries increased their production in order to meet British demands. But number one was definitely Egypt. Like, they're the ones who picked up most of the slack. Mm-hmm. Um, Egypt had just freed themselves a couple of decades earlier, before the Civil War, from the Ottoman Empire. Um, they they stepped up and became the world's largest cotton producer during the times of the Civil War. Um, so, in 1861, they have they had only exported, I see, six hundred thousand canters of cotton. I think a canter is like a, a pound. Oh, like a pound. A canter, mm. a canter is a pound. Cantars. A cantar is a pound. That's the unit of measurement that's used when measuring cotton. Um, but cantar. by 1863, it had more than doubled this to almost 1.3 million cantars. So more than a it, more than double the production of it right. in two years, and that's huge. with 
that's that's huge. And with their cotton revenue, they started pursuing these massive public work programs like um, like irrigation canals and the um, their you know railroad systems and things like that. But the the king of uh, of Egypt or the Sultan of Egypt, uh, whatever the title was was called at the times, um, let's call him the Sultan of Egypt, uh, Ishmael. He was um, he was trying to he was kind of like the Shah of Iran. He was trying to turn Cairo into like a European city. Um, I think he called he wanted the the, the he coined the name Paris on the Nile. <laughs> and um, in addition to the revenues, he was also taking out loans from the British from British and French banks. And what happened is that when the Civil War was over, the price of cotton dropped. So Egypt was stuck in really bad debt, and they they went bankrupt, mm-hmm. and that's what eventually led to their colonization by the British. That's what happens when so, you're a one-trick pony economy, you know. That, that, that's that's what happens. Um, but it's kind of interesting that the Civil War, the American Civil War, led to um, the cotton boom in Egypt and their eventual colonization by the British. All in like a five-year span. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the British started occupying um, when was Egypt, that, I think, in 1881. Okay, I think so the it was date longer is. than five years, but still. It was longer than five years, or <laughs> 1871. It was within, it was either in the 1870s or 1880s. That's when, there was never like a formal, they weren't like India, where they were like considered a formal colony. It was just under occupation. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget their exact... Um, exact title for for how they label the differences but vassal it was ship. <laughs> a vassal ship but it, the british had yeah. control over the government like yeah. a lot of their uh military uh, headquarters were based out of egypt during world war one um it was basically um a, a british puppet state for is this for, before or after the, they is this before or after they stole all the mummies i don't know what you're talking about one of the British takes all of the, you know, like Egyptian mummies and stuff like that and puts them in their own uh, museums. No? That might have been World War Two. I think I might be confusing the two. That wouldn't surprise me. Do um, you ever see, um, you know Cleopatra's Needle? No. What is that? It's an obelisk that um, I think it was built as, around the Middle Kingdom uh, of Egypt days. Like 3,000 years ago? It was built probably around 3,000 years ago. I think it was built um, like when Ramses II was king. Mm-hmm. So that would be like, what, 1300 BC or something like that? Probably. Um, or, or later. Who knows? And no, actually, yeah, probably somewhere between 2000 to 1000 BC. And um, basically, there's these there are these twin obelisks. And I think that they were in Cairo, but they were eventually moved to Alexandria. And um, they were the largest structures in all of Egypt. They were somehow purchased. I don't know the exact transactional history, but these obelisks, there, there are these magnificent structures. One was sent to England, to London. Mm-hmm. And I think either London took both, England took both of them and then sold one to the United States. Uh, but the other one's in Central Park, New York. Oh, I didn't know that. The other one's in Central Park. It's actually really cool. I used to live really close to it, and I used to see it all the time. Um, it is. How's it hold up? Not out like outside of the <laughs> the desert. <laughs> New York is it, rough, as is New, as is London. It holds up fine. It's protected. Everything in Central Park is is kept pretty well. Um, but under fun fact is that there's a time capsule underneath this obelisk. So if you wanted to to dig up underneath the obelisk, you'll find a, I think it was, it was from 1870, an 1870 cons- uh, um, consens- consensus bureau, um, um, a, a couple of Webster dictionaries, and I think uh, copies of Shakespeare are all in that time capsule. So mm-hmm. it was in the 1870s. So that, was, that obelisk was built, was brought here right after the Civil War. Hmm. So I would imagine that's something to do with that yeah, probably with, with Egypt, Egyptian debts and how they got how these things made their way to 
One is in London, and so the other maybe is. I was there. Right, maybe I was right about that. That's probably around the time when, when Britain started taking all of like the uh, ancient artifacts out of out of Egypt. Yeah, but that's that's interesting. I don't know why that popped up into my head right now, but <laughs> it is a very cool thing. If you're ever in Central Park in, in Manhattan, uh, see the obelisk. Um, it is a very cool sight. But uh, it, it wasn't just that. Um, speaking of colonization, because I, I want to go into this, the British were able to expand their imperial uh, <laughs> territories by a lot of the mil a lot of the innovations that came out of the pressures of the Civil War. Um, for instance, the Maxim gun. <clears throat> so the Maxim gun. Um, you ever hear that saying? It's like whatever happens, we've got the maxim, <coughs> the, the maxim, and they have not. Yeah, you've heard that. Mm -hmm. It's like the number one weapon that is is associated with uh, the scramble of Africa, like with the Boer Wars, right. when they were using them to just kind of slaughter thousands of people. And that's the maxim gun is is a machine. Well, I don't know if it's technically a machine gun, but is mm, I don't a, know. Is it is it still hand or, crank? I forget. I think it's hand it's hand cranked. I'm pretty sure it's hand cranked. Then technically it's um, not a machine gun, but it's still a, like a repeating gun. So is it? It's it's a uh, its origins are in the, the Gatling gun that comes right. out of the Civil War. Like once they saw what one of those could do, and they're like, oh, we can use this to expand our imperial territory. Oh no! Actually, it's the first recoil-operated machine gun. It is actually okay. this. So uh, m maybe we can jump around a little bit because I think a lot of people think of the Gatling gun as like the iconic gun um, for the Civil War, and they're not wrong. But it's what's interesting about it is that the Gatling gun wasn't actually used very much. Um, so it was definitely uh, uh, the most su successful of several types of these like rapid fire guns that were created shortly after the civil war but uh, the gatling gun was a, a rap technically a rapid firing multiple barrel firearm so not machine gun the machine and machine gun would imply that it is repeating automatically based on the recoil um you know, the gases of the recoil uh, but it was invented in 1861 by richard jordan gatling obviously that's where the name comes from um it was basically, uh, if you've not seen a Gatling gun in your life, it's it's on it's like an artillery gun. It's it's on wheels, weighs like 171 pounds, measures about 42 inches, fires something between like 200 and 900 bullets per minute, which was extremely fast then. And it really just depends on like the configurations because they had a few different ones, depending on the size of the rounds that it was shooting and like the number of barrels that it had, which was between six and 10. But it had a bunch of these barrels kind of around a cylinder. And as you would crank this, uh, um, the crank, uh, what it would do is it would automatically like fire the one round from the, uh, from the, uh, the barrel that was directly, I think on the 40 degree mark. Uh, and then as you turn it a little bit more, the next barrel would slide into place and then fire that one, uh, but the barrel that you just shot, uh, it would drop in a brand new round from a gravity-fed magazine at the top. Um, and it was pretty freaking cool uh, as far as like weapons go. And, and fun fact about it, uh, Richard Gatling, the guy who invented it, he actually hoped that making uh, such a ridiculously catastrophic weapon would convince people to stop doing war because it would be so ridiculously dangerous, but actually probably promoted more warfare. Um, but again, to kind of come back to the last point, you know, it wasn't extensively used in the Civil War. Like the armies of the North or the South didn't like buy a ton of these. They were personally purchased by specific generals uh, in the Union Army. Um, so 12 of them were purchased by some commanders uh, and like used in, in, in warfare there, but only 12. Um, one of them was used uh, during, uh, in trenches during the siege of St. Petersburg, uh, and that was in June, 1864. Um, eight other Gatling guns were purchased uh, and were fitted onto gunboats, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, but that's like 20 guns. That's like 20 of them total that were like, used that we know about that's not a lot <laughs> when you in the grand scheme of things in, in the ultimate carnage of a five-year war that is civil war that's it wasn't really used 
And the army really didn't, the northern army, I should say, didn't really accept the gun until after the war ended in 1866. When one of their sales reps from the Gatling company um, showed them an updated version that shot like something like 350 um, uh, rounds per minute. And they were like impressed and they're like, okay, cool, we'll get like a thousand of them. <laughs> um, but uh, Gatling guns were actually used less yeah, on we're, like, we're, yeah, go ahead. Weren't they used to quell protesters? Yep. Yeah, so like it was less used on the battlefield and more used for the protesters in the north, which is crazy. Um, there was this one uh, situation where uh, in New York uh, in July uh, 17, 1863, where evidently they used Gatling guns on some New York anti-draft rioters. They just unleashed Gatling guns on New Yorkers in, in 1863, which is fucking crazy. Um and then uh, again, two were brought to um, Pennsylvania by a National Guard unit um, from Philadelphia to use against strikers in Pittsburgh. I don't know the date for that, but another crazy situation. The New York riots in uh, 1863 were <laughs> nuts, in insane. Nuts were absolutely insane. Yeah. There are race riots. Mm -hmm. There are race riots between Irish immigrants and and uh, and, and black and. Uh, the new blacks that migrated over there. A lot of the black population was pushed out of Manhattan into Brooklyn. Like, it was very violent, and mm -hmm. there was, at the very least, over a hundred people were killed during those yeah. during those riots. Mm -hmm. There were not. But it was insane. Look, listen, man. Civil War is a complicated topic, and I know it's one of those things that people it's one of the american topics that there's all type of, of um, if you if you question the official narrative of the civil war you're immediately called either a um, lost cause sympathizer or you're called some type of like kooky revisionist um I am not sympathetic towards the uh, Confederacy. You should listen uh, to our episode for, on the origins. Slavery. Listen to our episode yeah, on the we'll origins to our of the Civil episode War. Or, <laughs> we're but pretty, we're whatever, pretty fair what, about it, I think. Yeah, we're, I think we're pretty. I think it gives you a pretty good rundown of what you know the reasons why uh, the South succeeded and, and why the North invaded. And it wasn't. And I'll just sum it up real quick. I, I don't believe the North invaded the South to. Uh, and slavery. I think they did it too. Uh, I think there's unquestionably undoubt enough evidence to prove that they did not invade the South to uh, end slavery. Um, there is laws saying that if they didn't leave the Union, that they could keep all their slaves. But the North, I'm just the, the North, the, the Union at that time was basically a dictatorship. Like America turned into a dictatorship for for four years under Lincoln, who was I mean, he was a tyrant. Like, he put journalists in jails. He fired on civilians. He did a lot of bad things. The outcome of the Civil War with the ending of slavery was obviously a humongous accomplishment. However, it was a lot of bad shit was happening within within Include, throwing journalists including in jails. using gatling guns on including anti, using gatling guns <laughs> anti draft riders on, on, on anti draft riders so ba ba just, last, last point to... last point last point on this gatling gun and then we can move on um so it, it the fact that it wasn't used very much in the battles is kind of weird um there's a, a ton of reasons why they they probably didn't use it but one of the main ones was that when you use this weapon it sustained firing of like this black powder would cause this giant cloud of smoke right like huge smoke cloud which made you amazingly like visible <laughs> like you could be a target for other artilleries like cannons and stuff like that or or um snipers i'm going to use that term liberally uh because the guns weren't that great but still um and it's kind of hard to shoot people when you can't see shit you know so that's probably one of the bigger reasons why they didn't use it and it wasn't until they started making smokeless powder you know uh in the late 19th century that that these kinds of guns would be like useful um but they this was the progenitor right this was this was a gun that 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 was the progenitor to the maxim gun which is ultimately a you know uh the first machine gun as we learned just today and all and uh you know a lot of those guns got replaced by even lighter single man operated machine guns right uh 
but this changed how how warfare was done it you know, no longer are people standing in nice gentlemen's warfare lines and saying hey you know have a good fight out there and like you know just shoot one shot and then like stand back reload and have the second wave shoot it, that wasn't going to happen anymore because of weapons like the gatling gun there were others that i want to talk about as well but um that that completely changed the like how war was fought forever well, let's talk about the the rifles because i think that's a huge yeah th that's a huge development in the mm -hmm. war so a brief history of of rifles so they started emerging on the battlefield around the 1400s and the 1500s like the 14th and no, the 15th and 16th century muskets um gunpowder is starts being used on the battlefield and it starts off with the ottoman empire using using them um during this period the the, the musket really revolutionized the role of infantry as we know it like muskets made it possible for uh, tightly packed infantry formations to engage cavalry mm -hmm. and they could engage them without um getting into close combat with them however on the negative side is that these things had a, an incredibly slow rate of fire yep. which would require a, a pikeman to protect them mm -hmm. so the mix that you had these units in europe at this time um like during periods of the of the 30-year war um and all the religious wars in europe um they had these mixed uh basic infantry structures that included just musketeers along with pikemen to protect them and that system lasted for about 200 years or so and before the musket or, or the first muskets were matchlocks on the battlefield so you literally had a it require a, a matchlock is um you're required uh, a forked stand to hold the barrel of the of the gun and like the a, rifleman like had to mm -hmm. Yeah, they had the rifleman had to ignite the powder with a, a handheld burning wick, <laughs> which um, which obviously made it very difficult to aim. Like, imagine trying to shoot something while lighting it, light, like lighting the. It's like lighting a like, like a bong while you're like trying to a shoot fire. somebody. You know, yeah. like it's weird. <laughs> yeah. So the the muskets were fire lock, and the, the fire lock used a trigger. And it allowed riflemen to hold the, the the weapon in both hands, and just made it a lot easier to to aim and shoot and 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 fire off more rounds within a minute. Or not? I don't even think they could fire a, a more than one round. More of like an accuracy muskets, play, probably yeah. maybe a round every two to three minutes or so. But more of like an accuracy thing. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of innovations with with these muskets, um, and. You know all of these innovations related to uh, increasing their uh, mainly their rate of fire along with their their range because most of these muskets they're ineffective beyond 100 yards or so. Yeah, it's like a maximum of 300 feet for like a smooth bore musket, uh, and that's that's not very far, you know, <laughs> especially on a very large battlefield like in the United States during the Civil War, you know, so. What, what they ended up doing uh, that really revolutionized these muskets was the invention of boring, right? So they, they would, uh, excuse me, uh, rifling. They, they would carve these grooves into the inside of the barrel, uh, and what that would do is it would cause the bullet to spin in the barrel as it was leaving the barrel, which would increase its rate of speed and increase the range at which it could hit. To, in some cases up to 900 feet which would have been three times longer than the smooth bore muskets and, and it made it super accurate too up to like five times more accurate so you know a single man uh, shooting um, a rifled rifle <laughs> uh, would be would be able to shoot three times farther and five times more accurate and a bit faster as well um, because of some of the you know innovations here and one of the other innovations that kind of paired with the with the rifling in the barrel uh was the mini ball i think it's pronounced mini ball mini mini i'm gonna call it mini ball 
I don't know how it's pronounced. Weird. Um, so mini ball had these little grooves, and mini balls look like what you would think a bullet would look like today. It wasn't like this round ball that they used to shoot out of muskets from before. Um, and the grooves on the end of it uh, would kind of grip the inside of that barrel so that it would rifle better, better so it would spin better inside of the barrel. Uh, and uh, they, it made them really, really effective pair, like the, the mini ball and the, and the uh, rifling. Fun fact about the rifling, those grooves often had a whole lot of bacteria in it, and when a soldier got shot by a gun that had bacteria in the barrel, um, the mini ball would capture that bacteria and bring it with it. And if you got hit and you got infected, the only way to deal with that was amputation. So that actually increased you know, amputations by quite a bit, just because the fucking guns were dirty. <laughs> yeah that's something that's understated in that in that war the amount of amputees and people who lost limbs and legs and arms and and um oftentimes just, just by getting hit by one one shot that's it yeah and it's 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 crazy but a lot of medical achievements come out of the civil war as well yeah. mm -hmm. um in addition and just like things that you wouldn't really think about like um, tend like uh, canned food comes out of the Civil War. Right. Well, I, I think um, Napoleon was using canned food. For well, his, Napo his, um, Napoleon parties. was using it, but they weren't using it at the scale. Uh, no, of, no, of not, not even the Civil War. Yeah. Uh, to to that point, with uh, our am ambulances uh, were created, army ambulances at least. Uh, Jonathan Letterman, uh, who was the medical director of the Army of the Potomac, he actually created the first tra organized transport of wounded people, uh, which we now know as ambulances. Uh, and it would basically consist of a group of soldiers who sucked, who were not like generally thought of as not being good, like unfit for fighting. <laughs> um, and they would move together in a division. They'd have a line surgeon, uh, two stretcher bearers, so guys carrying the stretcher, um, and one driver per ambulance. And they would go to the field, pick up the wounded, and bring them back to you know like dressing stations, uh, and then eventually to field hospitals. But that wasn't a thing before, you know. So now it is. That's super interesting. That's where it came from. And not to mention just um, just all right. So the telegraph comes comes out <laughs> as right, well. Yeah, let's so talk about the telegraph. There, there's so many. There's so many like just um, kind of amazing achieved technological achievements that happened during this period and under under these pressures or at the very least um a lot of things uh, staple things from the industrial revolution um are at least at the very least mass produced during this period so the telegraph yep yep and i think this is the this the telegraph had existed before you know like i think the earliest uh true quote telegraph was um, uh, an optical telegraph, technically, by Claude Chappé, French dude, in the late 18th century. It was used in France and in Europe. Chappé. Chap Chappé. Um, and used heavily during the Napoleonic eras. Um, but the electric telegraph started to replace the optical telegraph in that mid-19th century area, and it was mostly uh, pioneered by Samuel Morse. Uh, with Morse code, hello, that's where that comes from. Um, it was a bit slower to like kick off in in France uh, because they already had a pretty established like optical uh, telegraph system, but uh, the electric telegraphs were put into use with with uh, like a code that was compatible with the Schalp uh, tel um, optical telegraph, which made it just easier for them to transition into it. Um, and then eventually after that, uh, Morse code, the Morse system was developed. It was became the international standard by 1865, which would have been by the end of the American Civil War here. Um, using like a modified Morse code that was developed in Germany. Um, but Morse code was nuts because of the infrastructure that they needed to develop in order to make like, like telegraphs work. So during the war, they built 15,000 miles of telegraph cable and it was laid purely for military purposes. You know, um, basically they would station these wagons just behind the front lines with some wires and the wires would go back deeper into you know their own territory and they would relay a whole lot of information right it would allow commanders to like instantly communicate with you know um the front lines uh from their you know desks i don't know where the hell they were 
Um, Lincoln was famous for regularly visiting like a telegraph office every day to get like the latest news and give orders and stuff like that. But it would allow people to you know figure out troop movements, move things around, get quick battle results. It also enabled news sources to get to be able to report on the war really quickly. So I guess you can say this was the start of the mainstream media mob. <laughs> um, but the obvious benefits I think that we get out of you know um, the telegraph, you know, I think helped become the catalyst for the telegraph's rapid expansion. And in many ways, you can say that the telegraph kind of shrunk our world down by making communication over long distances much, much easier and much more pervasive. Um, some interesting facts. So from May 1st, 1861 to June 30th, 1865, the USMT or the United States Military Telegraph Service handled 6.5 million messages at a total cost for everything, all in for the like construction and like operation and maintenance and stuff like that. Total cost of these 6.5 million messages was $2.65 million or 41 cents per message in their money. So these texts were pretty expensive. <laughs> Each of them cost a lot of money when you factor in all the all the stuff. But I mean, you know, the, this this stuff was super critical for, for warfare, but, you know, ultimately for communications all over the planet. You know, and that also changed, I think, a lot of the ways that we think about, you know, uh, distance, right? We, we've effectively killed distance. I think, all right, that's, this is the major uh, theme and, and topic I want to touch on because I think this could be the, the, the biggest impact. It, it connected the world to each other or with each other mm -hmm. using the railroad systems. Right. And I guess in a uh, military perspective, um, you're going to, you could say something like it increased the strategic capacity into where you're able to um, uh, put troops on the battlefield at a faster rate. But in a civilization, just like in a civilian life, you know, you're able to get to uh, from New York City to Memphis, Tennessee, and and not sure how long, probably about a day or less than a day or so. Mm -hmm. Usually, that trip takes you uh, a couple of weeks on horseback, or at the very least, a week or so on horseback. Like right. the distances that are defeated are uh, are are crazy mm -hmm. when you when you really think about it. It's like a a um, kind of a long battle that really separates societies from each other. Right. Um, because when you think about like, I was, um, I drove fr from New York to Chicago a couple, uh, about two months ago. Mm -hmm. And I was like, the whole time I'm thinking, I'm like, holy shit, people fucking walk, like people <laughs> walk this, <laughs> walk this distance at one point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it took probably me, on like a horse or some shit like that, but still. On a horse, but still, or on a bandwagon. Right. Um, but I was just, in my head, I'm like, man, this is a 15-hour drive, and I can't believe that people actually did this trip without um, any type of automobile or... Did this trip or, at 15 miles an hour. Max. Yeah. Because you basically are different countries. Like, that's the... Um, different worlds yeah, for, for it, many for in many ways because when you think about it like the middle of our country um like places like south dakota um they're beautiful scenically however they're so remote you know like how do you get from a place like rapid city to anywhere else like where like where's the closest airport you know mm -hmm. we're i guess we're kind of lucky on the east coast where uh we can pretty much drive really anywhere within a couple of hours not or within maybe the longest distance would be going from you know new york to florida which would be about what a 15 hour car trip but everywhere everywhere else it's a little longer <coughs> unless you're really flying and there's no traffic <laughs> yeah um but yeah railroads um, so r both railroads and telegraphs right these are the things that like bridge you know the world together a lot. Before we move off of uh, um, uh, telegraphs, though, and, and go on to the railroads, though, I, I do want to talk about the um, uh, uh, aerial reconnaissance, because I found this pretty interesting. Uh, they were using balloons 
both sides. They were using hot air balloons to survey uh, battlefields. And what was cool about it was that they would just string up some telegraphs in the basket of the hot air balloon. Hot air balloon would go up a couple miles off the, you know, to two, three miles off of the uh, the battlefield, but they'd still be able to see it. So they'd be like, oh yeah, the, uh, the other army, yeah, they're over there, they're setting up camp, they're, you know, they got about 10,000 people or something like that. And they were able to just like tap in all of that information through the wire, get it all, all the information out. And it was funny because like there was literally no danger for these balloonists because First of all, they were kind of far away from the battlefields, but even if they were right there, like along the battlefields, the guns sucked so much uh, that they <laughs> they couldn't really do very much damage from that that much distance. Um, but yeah, balloons. They, were using, they don't have anti-aircraft yet, unfortunately. Yeah, no. No, totally. Um, they don't have S-300s or <laughs> Patriot no. missile systems yet. Nope, nope. But the Balloon Corps was actually a like pretty much a civilian um, thing. They're, they weren't given military ranks because all the all the generals and people thought that they were silly. Um, <laughs> they were like, oh, just look at these balloon dudes, look at these balloon guys, Mr. Balloon Hands. Um, and uh, oh yeah, the first. Uh, I'm Lieutenant General from the. I'm a Lieutenant General on the Balloon Force. <laughs> the Balloon Force. Hey, don't don't hate, man. We've got a balloon. We've got balloons still till today. Believe it or not, we still use balloons. There is a balloon called the Joint Land Attack Cruise Missile Defense Elevated Netted Sensor System. It cost $175 million. I thought balloons were just meant to um, accidentally take people into, like, fantasy world or something. Mm -hmm. like, nah, like, man. It's you end up in imagination land. Surveillance blimps are, like, really important, especially during the, uh, the, the Civil War, but... We, we apparently still have them. $175 million balloon. <laughs> a, a $170 million a piece? Yep. Yeah, and the name is ridiculous. I'll say it again. Joint Land Attack Cruise Missile Defense Elevated Netted Sensor System. Huh. Say that five times fast. Yeah. I wonder what it does. It, it looks at stuff. It looks it looks at stuff. Yeah. And, uh... It's a nice contract for who, who makes it Lockheed Martin. <laughs> I have no idea. I didn't look that part up. I'm sure they do, no. though. I'm sure they do, though. This is like the pinnacle of like the the war industry when we can still. We buy. need more balloons on the battle. We need to put uh, somebody in. Someone's going to comment like, "You fucking balloons! They saved my life in Afghanistan." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we've ever deployed balloons in. Afghanistan, though, um, but I know we still have them, and that was right. that was that was popularized during the Civil War. So railroads, yeah, railroads. Um, well, I, I want to hammer on this one because this is this is big. Um, so, in some sense, in, in a libertarian point of view, um, <laughs> you know, at least good libertarians. A lot of them aren't fond with a lot of the things that Lincoln did as far as um, merging industry and state together. And that is one of the main critiques of his of his presidency. And um, a lot of people I, I don't abide by the lost cause um, type uh, theories about the South succeeding for simply preserving Jeffersonian republicanism. Um, I think it had to do with a lot of... Their, listen to our Civil yeah, War. Listen episode. to the other podcast. Let's not get I don't into want to get into all the reasons why the South <laughs> yeah. succeeded, but it, it's complicated. Um, but our uh, the libertarian critique is that Lincoln merged industry and state, and state at the very least and mm -hmm. was um, subsidizing railroad companies um, at the expense, he was picking winners and losers in, in the rail industry. Mm -hmm. So, um, won him the war, though. It was an example of cronyism mm -hmm. that um, people from, you know, someone from like the Mises Institute, who's more uh, kind of hardcore Rothbardian, would 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 write about that or would bring that up as as a fair as a as a critique of him. But yeah, it did give them a tremendous advantage in the war. 
the, the railway system. Absolutely, yeah. And, and actually, Lincoln um, himself was a former railroad lawyer. And He's a railroad lawyer. Yeah, he was a railroad lawyer. So that's obviously part of the cronies. That's, like, yeah, that's part like, of the like, that's part of the like that's that's where that that was part of the problem. Now. But the fact that he was a railroad lawyer did give him kind of an insight on how vital trains are and could be for moving people and supplies around quickly. And so railroads became vital strategic arteries for the war, right? And the capture of rail hubs was a huge priority for both sides of the war, right? Uh, although what, what I did find interesting in, in nerding out about like the technology here is that apparently track gauges, so the distance between uh, the two metal bars uh, on a rail, weren't were different in a lot of time, uh, times, especially between north and south. But even sometimes in the north and in the south, they weren't always consistent. So like you couldn't ride certain trains in certain on certain tracks, which was interesting. Um, but um, that was, that happened in uh, World War Two. When, when they standardized them, the Soviet mm -hmm. Soviet when when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, when they got deep in there, they couldn't transport troops on Soviet rail lines because they used different gauges. Right, because they were different, right? But they, yeah. I mean, these trains would go about twenty miles per hour, which doesn't sound like a whole lot. But when you're talking about moving an entire army, right, right or a whole brigade from one place to another relatively quickly with like very, you know, very little cost and very effectively, this was like the main way to get shit done. And they would pack these trains up. Like you would often see super overcrowding on these trains, where the soldiers would be riding on top of of like trains and stuff like that. But you know, the North did had a pretty strong advantage. Uh, they had a superior infrastructure. They had over twenty thousand miles of track. Uh, they had better equipment, and they had their own locomotive factory. Uh, whereas the South uh, just had nine thousand miles of track, so less than half. And they had recently converted their locomotive factory into an armaments factory. So probably a bad idea. Um, but that's, that wasn't the whole story, right? Like, Because if you just look at it that way, it's, it's like, oh, well, that's why the North won. <clears throat> but actually, the South did better with railways in the beginning of the war than the North did. Uh, and that's because they didn't have this cronyism stuff going on. So they were able to like basically use you know, the trains to their advantage first uh, to transport soldiers and things like that to vital uh, vital areas. There's this one battle, uh, the Battle of Bull Run, the first Battle of Bull Run, where they actually moved half of the Confederate army via rail to help fight a single fucking battle. Which is fucking phenomenal. Like, that wasn't a thing before. You don't move half of the entire army in one go. Like, that would have been a logistical nightmare. Um... But the reason why they were doing better, uh, despite having fewer railroads and fewer locomotives and fewer everything, honestly, was because the North was all mucked up with like private railroad owners that were super concerned about how much money they can charge the Union for using their railways and their locomotives rather than how they can help the war effort. So, I mean, th th there were some serious repercussions to this. The Secretary of War, uh, Simon Cameron, was forced to resign when when it got it came out that he was basically profiting from the War Department contracts for railroad shipping. So almost this is like the infancy of. It's interesting that we talk about this just two episodes after we had Christian Sorensen on, where we're talking about the the you know military industrial complex, and this is kind of like the like infancy there, right? This is like the this is it. No, this is this is the. One of the legacies of the Civil War is the merger of state and business. Mm -hmm. I think that, in, at least in America, like that, there there is a merger between industry and government that happens in this time period. Um, and I think it's one of the things that, if you're studying the military-industrial complex or things like that, I think this is a good starting point mm -hmm. to be like, hey, okay, I want to investigate like. The relationships between business and state, and and um, uh, how how they impact each other. I think this is this is a the Civil War is the is the is a, is a good case study for for this. Um, but yeah, um, do you think that a lot of the logistics of being able to put at, at, at least at the very beginning of the war? Um, See the problem with that the North had is that 
their officers and their soldiers were green as cucumbers. You know, like <laughs> they, a lot of the veterans from the Mexican American war were on Confederate. A lot of the military commanders were, um, were from States like Virginia or yeah. North Carolina, Virginia being the most like, um, Virginia is where most of the Confederate soldiers were from Virginia, North Car- Carolina, the vast majority of Confederate soldiers were from those two States. And, um, do you think that then they had experience dealing with the logistical, uh, movement of troops on trains prior to that? That's something I'm really not too no. sure about. <clears throat> no, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I'm, they're, they're, I'm fairly certain that pretty much everybody was like, oh, let's, let's try and use this train instead. Let's see if it works. Yeah. I, I think that was like a Hail Mary play. And I think that the, the Confederates did a pretty good job. And, and I guess to your point, the reason why they were they figured it out quicker and better is because they had more seasoned, um, more seasoned generals and more seasoned commanders. Um, but at the end of the day, the North wasn't dumb either. And they just had way more everything literally way more everything they had a much more diverse economy which you know obviously helped them to build the railroads in the first place you know they manufactured 90 percent of all the goods in in the united states you know they had 17 times more textiles 30 times more shoes and boots 13 times more iron 32 times more firearms and the north could move those via railway much easier because they had more than two times the amount of railways and they had a hell of a lot more locomotives to move it around. So while they might have been a bit slower to the game, um, they ultimately beat them, you know, with just overwhelming numbers. The US, the, the the North had 419 locomotives, and if, if I'm not uh, the, I don't recall. I didn't. I don't think I wrote this down, um, but I don't recall the number of southern locomotives there were but i can tell you that the number of um locomotives that were produced in the south after the war started was zero all of the locomotives that the south had and utilized in the war were locomotives that they had prior to or that they had captured from the north jesus yep that's uh that's that's pretty that's low. Yeah, and can't I guess get any lower during, than zero. <laughs> during, during, I guess during the conflict they couldn't even lay out new tracks either. No, and it was incredibly expensive for them, right? So they, what did they do? They did four hundred miles of of um, uh, track annually, and the North was doing four thousand miles of track annually. The cost of uh, just making wheels for. Um, for cast iron wheels for the locomotives in the South was $15 in 1861 at the start of the war. Um, that's $15 their time money to $500 in 1865. So I don't actually know how much that translates to in today's money, but just think about it going from 15 bucks to 500 bucks to make wheels. They just did, they did not have the economy to support it. It just wasn't there. Yeah, absolutely not. Um, when you're a one-trick pony economy like the South was at that time, um, you're not going to last in a war of attrition against a uh, comparatively to yourself has almost unlimited resources. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's go to the uh, let's talk about the uh, naval ships because okay. that's a huge that's a huge development as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, because this is something, admittedly, I, I actually really don't know much about the um, the naval battles of the Confed of, of the Civil War. I had a story. I think I told on this podcast that I was in um, Portland, Maine, and I saw some plaque uh, talking about these naval battles that happened. I believe uh, with Confederate uh, privateers um, mm-hmm. versus Union ships, and I was like, "Holy shit!" I never knew any of this happened ever. Like, and I was like <laughs> mesmerized by this, this plaque in Portland. Um, but, um, so it, let's talk about these ironclad warships that, that start coming around. Now, 
they're originally produced in England or and sold to to the north, or are they produced in America? I've always kind so, of so it. Um, I think that it's a bit of a misnomer. Like an ironclad is just a steam powered warship that was yeah. protected by iron or steel armor plates, right? Yeah, it's not like it's, a dread. Not yeah, it's not like a, like a mo- it's not like a model or anything like that. It was yeah. just like a like a class of ship, really. And I think you know, at the start of the Civil War, the North had a like distinctly huge naval advantage uh, against the South because the the North had a navy and the South didn't. Uh, the majority of the um, the navy of the United States, they just decided to stick with the North, right? Um, and so the U.S. Navy at the time didn't have any uh the northern navy didn't have any ironclads when the war started the most powerful ships i think they had were like steam-powered frigates but they were made of wood right and since you know since most of the navy stayed with the north the south had again to like get crafty uh and so what they tried to do they figured out all right well let's start acquiring these ships or retrofitting these ironclad ships so they did purchase some from abroad um, but the majority of them they actually just retrofitted their existing you know uh, boats with just armor on them Um, and in 1861 the confederate congress appropriated two million dollars for the purchase of ironclads um, from overseas Uh, and uh, basically in july and august they started getting to work on on just either constructing their own or or you know redoing the ones that they had you know and putting armor on those um basically it was like what was important about ironclads was that they exploited a huge vulnerability of wooden warships and that was that they're made of wood and so all you needed was explosive or like incendiary like flaming stuff you just burn them out of the sea right but if they've got armor and they're made of steel then you can't do that and also, one really interesting tactic that they would just that just came out of nowhere. Um, and actually, you can prop this was like an ancient tactic that was used by the Greeks with their with their um, longships, just straight up ramming things. They just rammed stuff. Like that was like a, a finishing blow with the ironclads was just ram the shit out of somebody because like these ships were much stronger than the wooden ships. It wasn't until after the first couple of clashes, you know, between wooden ships and, and, you know, ironclads that I guess the North started realizing, like, oh, shit, we should probably also have this. (laughs) Um, And that de facto replaced all wooden ships as, like, the strongest, you know, uh, in their fleets. And um, important things to know about these, that they were steam-powered. So they didn't have to worry about sails or like what direction the fucking wind was going, you know. Um, they just go, which was also another reason, coincidentally, why they were able to ram stuff because they just they just go. Um, and they also uh, were able to heavily exploit u- the use of explosive shells on their um, on their boats. And and uh, at least eight of these had Gatling guns on them, as I mentioned before. Um, so this was like a huge, huge step up for, for naval warfare. Um, you ever hear of, uh, Archimedes, Archimedes? Archimedes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, do, do, do you know the invention that he made? Or what, hear about the, the, the naval inventions beam? that he made? The yeah, laser he, made beam? A la- <laughs> he made a laser beam. Um, yeah, this is back in Rome, yeah. the ancient, like, uh, uh, during the Punic Wars, the mm-hmm. first Punic Wars, he made a, like a basically a, a laser that um, it was a mirror that captured sunlight yeah the mirror that like, captured the sunlight yeah. and you uh, put it on ships and they were supposed to light on fire that was um, a thing <laughs> that, that was that was the thing I don't know if it ever worked <laughs> I, I honestly because well, you had to have like the perfect like weather conditions and like get the angle of the sun right it's like hey wait stay right there while I focus the sun on your sails <laughs> I, oh, oh, sir, he's bluffed. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, all right, so... Well, uh, um, so one interesting battle, sorry, before we move off of that, uh, it was two ironclad ships. It was the USS, USS Monitor and the CSS Virginia, which I think was probably the first uh, fight between two ironclad ships, um, and that was March 9th, 1862, uh, and apparently the Monitor whipped the shit out of the Merrimack. <laughs> so... And and like a whole bunch of other Confederate steamers as well. 
Yeah, and um, a lot of these Confederate ships were like using like grape shot and stuff like that, right? Yep. Yeah, they're they're like really interestingly pieced together. Well, that led them to make a lot of kind of um, at least be resourceful of yes. a lot of the Very things that they, things. they they did have, because um, they were the ones that first developed naval mines and and yep. and torpedoes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Well, um, torpedo. I'm going to use in like heavy quotes. Pretty much anything that exploded was a torpedo, and the first torpedo that were made were like mostly just mines, what we would consider a mine. Um, but they sunk like something like 40, you know, uh, Union ships using, quote, torpedoes. Um, and but but th those, quote, torpedoes uh, basically helped us to create landmines and grenades and use those in later wars. Like the idea behind them was like transmuted into the into landmines and grenades. Where, where does um the submarines come in. Oh, okay, we can talk about the submarines. So that's another crafty way that the South was trying to figure shit out. They were like, all right, well, we can't beat all of these ships that the Union has, but if they can't see us, then they can't hurt us, right? So they made these submarines. One famously, most the, the first submarine to ever successfully uh, sink a ship was the CSS Huntley, um, Hunley, excuse me, uh, it was kind of a chop shop job. Uh, it had a lot of downsides. I think it sunk twice before they ever got it to work well. Um, like before they even got it to work, it was sinking. <laughs> so it was basically the F-35, right? It was falling out of the sky. In this case, it was sinking into the ocean and uh, it wasn't working. And then one day uh, it got into a tiff, the only tiff that it was, um, that it was you know, used successfully against uh, against the USS. Jeez, uh, how do you say this? Housatonic, Housatonic, something like that. USS Housatonic, uh, which was part of that naval blockade of Charleston, North Carolina, and they rammed it with a submarine, <laughs> with a primitive submarine, the CSS Hunley, and it worked. It worked. Um, they were able to scuttle the ship. Um, they. Uh, it worked twice, actually. Um, they accidentally did it once, uh, and then they did it again, and, and that's that's ultimately what what caused the the ship to sink, and it killed twelve people um, uh, on the ship. Oh, excuse me, the the USS Hunley, uh, the CSS Hunley, the submarine, killed twelve people before it was successful in killing other people. Meaning, it killed its own crew members because it sunk twice beforehand. Sorry, I was reading that wrong. The it killed five people on the Housatonic that day when it was actually successful. So it actually killed more people, like, on the wrong side than it did on the right side. And then on the way back, it never returned to base because it sank for the third and final time. And it killed all of its crew again. <laughs> did they ever find it? Uh, yeah, actually, they pulled it out of the water. Um, when did they pull it out of the water? I forgot about that. Uh, I don't recall. It was much, much later, like, I want to say 1900-something. You know. Okay, so it was decades after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. much, much longer later that did they figure out where it was, and they were like, oh, look. I guess they didn't have they didn't have <laughs> radar back then to find <laughs> these ships. Yeah. Um, so let's, do, do you want to talk about, um, you know, some, maybe some of the less, hostile uh, things maybe something more so like um, because photography sure it wasn't just military equipment there was things that again you know we're talking overall inventions that were created um, Civil War photography comes out um, huge yeah it's huge event I don't understand how a camera works to this day I just think it's magic it's it is actually magic it's still magic to me and I did a ton of research on this it's weird I don't get it um, but I, I, to your point you know f Civil War photography was the first successful war photography ever in in the past what people would uh, do, what people would do is painters would literally go onto the battlefield with soldiers and they would just watch and then after the battle, they would go sit down and like paint a pic like a pretty picture of like what they saw, and that was like cute, right? 
Um, but what it failed to like do was capture the brutality of war. Like it did, you weren't seeing paintings of like bloated corpses littering a battlefield, you know, or like shelled cities. That wasn't a thing. I mean, some painters, some war painters, tried to capture like the, you know, the the the, the grotesqueness of war. Um, I'm reminded of uh, Otto Dix in World War One, which is much later, um, but he's he makes a bunch of crazy paintings that show war as hell. Um, but a painting doesn't do it like a photograph did, and it wasn't as stark and, and stunning. And just the act of this photo photography was just it was crazy. Um, photographs existed before the the um, the Civil War, but you know I think. The process is so crazy that, you know, just to think about this happening shortly after a battle is kind of nuts. So what would happen is it, they would, it was called a like wet plate photographic process. So they would take this collodion, uh, I don't know what a collodion is, but it's, it's a thing. It was like a, like, a, um, like a chemical, if you will. And it was used to coat a plate of glass to make it like sensitive to light. Uh, and then in a dark room, like, you know, this is where they have like a little covering over the, the actual camera. Uh, the plate's immersed in silver nitrate. Um, and then they would take the cap off of the camera for two to three seconds. And that's how long the exposure was. Which, so the light would come through, it would hit the glass. It's in this like chemical stew. And somehow magically uh, it would imprint onto the glass the image. I still don't get it. It's weird. It's chemistry. It's strange. The whole ordeal was pretty incredible uh, for for the time, but it was very difficult to do. And so you'll never see Civil War pictures that are um, candid. That's not a thing, because it was it was too labor intensive and too difficult to do. So what they would do is they would come in after a battle and they would take a picture of the landscape or they would take a, um, uh, portraits of the victors, you know, or just of anyone, honestly. But those portraits and those landscapes were fucking gruesome. And it showed oh, yeah. people for the first time, like, this is what war is. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's real interesting because over... You, I mean, you can look up Civil War photos and, and see basically a bunch of soldiers kind of standing over a destroyed battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, they're very, very creepy, honestly. They have a very eerie, eerie vibe to them. Um, and it, it's the same for World War I. Um, you ever see World War I photos? It's all just horror, you know? Mm -hmm. Because prior to, you know, in Europe before World War I, there had been a romantic view on on a lot of conflicts and um i'd imagine it's because you're not you, you don't have the um generations of people without limbs and who need uh plastic surgery i mean plastic surgery really kind of takes off after world war one because there's so many uh there's so many um, um veterans <laughs> who are mutilated yeah but the same thing happened in, in the u.s um because Comparatively, there is a – so here's something I wanted to uh, br uh, bring out because I've actually found this, this really um, interesting study on, on uh, lethality. Uh, lethality and casualties is the, is the name of the study. And um, essentially um, – so beginning in 1860, um, the pace of weapons developed rapidly due to things that we just discussed mass production manufacturing um and also the, dis the distribution of technical journals which goes underrated like a lot of these weapons were made possible because there was um you, because manufacturers were able to circulate different journals and there were scientific journals that um shared knowledge on you know the mechanics and the chemistry and how to make all this stuff and this results in weapons becoming the most lethal um, ever in human history at that time. 
Um, however, uh, this historian named T.N. Dupay, um, he calculated how the impact of increased killing power uh, translates to battlefield casualties. And he notes that the killing power of modern weapons compared to the weapons of antiquity increased by a factor of 2,000. So he's looking at modern weapons. And this is, so we're we're talking about 1950. This is when, I think the study was on in the 1950s. So weapons at that time period are 2,000. The deadliness of weapons from maces and pikes and swords and cavalry units um, they increase by a factor of 2,000. But he also notes that the uh, the dispersion of forces on the battlefield made possible by mechanization and the ability of fewer soldiers to deliver more firepower has increased by a factor of 4,000. Wow. So the ability to move troops around, um, the ability to... Um, not condense all your troops in one place. And the result actually led to fewer casualties as a percentage of the committed forces on the battlefield. Hmm. So this chart, if we're on, I can, I'll try to superimpose it because I saw this chart. It, it goes back um, from the six, it starts in the 1600s and you could see that the percentage of casualties uh, go down, or are going down pretty much every single year. So um, the study shows that as weapons become more destructive, um, armies react by adjusting their tactics to minimize potential targets, um, leading to a decline in battle casualties as weapons even get deadlier and deadlier. So during a battle in the Thirty Years' War, an average of the winner of the winner of the battle would have about twenty percent casualties, and the loser would have about thirty percent. Mm. Now, this goes down year after year until the nineteen fifties. Um, so, this is taking account like the Korean War. That's like the last major conflict that this is studies. Um, so, if you look at other wars in, in World War One, it was about twelve percent. Uh, 12 percent um and in world war ii was about nine percent so we're talking about how many casualties how many of your committed force were casualties in that war so world war one is 12 percent world war ii is nine percent so it goes down now in the chart interestingly enough there's these two spikes during this curve and the one the first spike is the, the napoleonic war which has between 15 to 20 percent casualties, mm-hmm. and that's a large reason of the way that Napoleon, um, um, just like how formed, he deployed his troops, right? how he de- <clears throat> how he deploys his troops, he used column tactics, which reduced the ability to uh, of uh, of spreading forces around. But the Civil War is a huge spike as well. It's 21 percent. It's 21 to 23 percent. Mm-hmm. So. Meaning that there's, if you were a um, soldier in a Civil War army, there was about a 21% chance that you would become a, a battlefield casualty. So either dead or out of commission with a wound that would prevent you from going back into battlefield. So as a, as a, as a proportion of the people that were committed to war, the Civil War was... By and large, m- more deadly than World War One or other wars. Yes. yes, for the portion. Now, of course, that the World War One and World War Two, obviously, the death count is much higher. Right. But Ridiculous the reason why it's so much higher is is because of the of the armies. The nation state is at an all time um, high at that time. Like right. these, these are very, very powerful nation states with millions and millions of people like like millions of people in these armies and they're wasting them like hell um but just the i don't know how the study applies to maybe like the soviet union forces in world war ii i would imagine that um the soviet russia tends to always have really really high casualties Casualties it's not always because of the war itself but the ancillary 
it, it's like starvation. It's, <laughs> yeah, star, starvation and lack of resources, like mm-hmm. just troops going in. And in, in World War One, there, there are stories about how um, t- troops would be sharing shoes. Like someone would a die, a soldier would die, and then um, the other soldier would take his shoes afterwards. Or there'd be one rifle for two for two soldiers. So okay. meaning that one person would get shot and killed, and the other person would take his rifle. Um, th- things like that. Um, but the reason why the casualties were so high in the Civil War wasn't because of, we're talking about open battlefields, so you would think that there would be a priority on uh, the dispersion of forces, so they're, they're not all in one place. But there were um, mass formations were thrown against defensive positions frequently during the war mm. and things became meat grinders really quickly so it was unique in that setting and in, in, in its deadliness um and, and that's why the casualty rate was was uh was, was so high because hundreds of thousands of if you include both the south and the north we're, we're talking about uh, around 700,000 dead in that war mm-hmm. and the United States is still not really a nation state yet. Like it is a nation state, but Fledged it's not. Nation state. It's a it's a young it's a young nation state. Right. Um, it's not like a powerhouse nation state like in Europe. It's um, so it's it's pretty astonishing to kind of look at those uh at those numbers and and uh right. well, and, to, and put to, it into context to kind of relate that back to the previous thing that we were talking about. Uh, with photography, you know, we you just accurately described how ridiculously brutal it was, and now we have a method to show people exactly how brutal it was. Yeah, it's um, it was it was hell. It, it certainly it was uh, just an awful awful thing, and I just want to add, I kind of I, we were talking before this podcast, we're at a hour and a half right now so i think we can yeah, start we can wrapping wrap things up mm-hmm. but um you know people are always talking about civil war in america there's gonna be a new civil war and i always just roll my eyes whenever yeah. i hear that nobody in this country wants to do that not even close nobody is thinking about grabbing their rifle and uh engaging in some type of warfare against another American, and if they are thinking, they're not thinking over over <laughs> what asshole is in the White House. <laughs> so like, so it's um, I just think it's uh, a lot of LARPing when people talk about yep. civil war, man, civil war. Mm-hmm. Um, most people don't want to live in the conditions of uh, sleeping outside and having your family killed and. All these hor- horrible things that happened with with when societies go to war. Um, all right, that's all I have to say. Um, in conclusion, the Civil War was a very important part of history, and it has impacted not only the United States but the rest of the world. There, that that would be the last sentence in my in my thesis paper. I love it. In in conclusion. In conclusion. Um, all right, man. Well, right. that's that's a that's a that's a great place to stop it. There, there was plenty all of right. other like like this was not an exhaustive like you know list, and hopefully this you know interested you enough to do more research. And there was plenty more cool guns and you know vehicles and random technologies that were created that we probably could have talked about as well. And if you like this one this much, maybe we'll do it again and we'll do more. Uh, just let us know. Um, great way to to do that would be you know if you're watching on youtube in the comment section there or uh if you're listening uh on apple podcast give us a uh five star rating and a and a and a subscribe because that that helps us the most to do what we do best and uh you know climb to the top echelons of the azari podcasting world yeah we ha- we're, we're hot right now we want to help us continue to stay on top of azerbaijan um radio uh azerbaijan uh 
podcast, uh, chart, yeah. chart, podcast yeah. charts. So <laughs> make sure that you rate and review the podcast. Rate and review the podcast. It is the number one way to help us grow this show. Uh, we're almost at 400 ratings. So it seems like just yesterday I was annoying you to get us to 100. So mm -hmm. uh, rating the podcast does a lot for it. Rate and review the show if you're on Apple. Um, if you also would like to further support us, we have a Patreon. Um, the Patreon, we sometimes release some content, early content, some early episodes, mm -hmm. uh, and some additional additional stuff. Uh, but the real cool thing is our Slack. Um, so you can join our Patreon. You get access to our Slack account. And the Slack account is just a fun way for people to talk and chat and, and uh, argue and share stories and stuff like that. I, it's really fun. I'm really happy we started this. Mm -hmm. And we have a great group of guys who or, and gals who are in the Slack um, talking, and it's, it's a fun thing. So join the Slack uh, by supporting us on Patreon. And that's all I have to plug in right now. All right. Peace, I guess, right? Peace. <laughs> that was the most awkward ending ever. All right, peace. <laughs>